Good. So Philippians 3, starting with verse 7, we'll go through verse 19. If you need to read along, feel free. Uh, let's recite it slowly. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I count as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. However, let us keep living to that same standard to which we have already attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. <clears throat> I wanted to share briefly on, the, uh, on that last verse, verse 19. Um, one thing that I had seen, uh, this reminded me of actually, was um, a psalm in Psalm 78. You can turn there if you want. The, but the phrase I'm, I really want to focus on is, whose God is their appetite. Whose God is their appetite. Um, and I had seen this separately. I wasn't really thinking about it in Philippians 3 and then reading through Philippians 3. I was reminded of it. But in Psalm 78, in, um, starting in verse 17, Asaph here is talking about um, God's deliverance of the people uh, of Israel from Egypt and his doing many great things up to this part. And then in verse 17, well, you see in verse 15, he split the rock in the wilderness. That's kind of where we are chronologically. He's worked these amazing miracles on behalf of Israel after leading him out of Egypt. And then in verse 17, he says, Yet they still continued to sin against him, to rebel against the Most High in the desert. And in their heart, they tested, sorry, they put God to the test by asking for food according to their desire. So that's what reminded me of this, whose God is their appetite in Philippians. It goes on to say, so they ask for food according to their desire. They spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rocks so that waters gushed out and streams were overflowing. But can he give bread also? Will he provide meat for his people? <clears throat> Therefore the Lord heard and was full of wrath, and a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also mounted against Israel, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven, and he rained down manna upon them to eat and gave them food from heaven. Then if you skip down to verse 29, it says, So they ate and were well filled, and their desire he gave to them. Before they had satisfied their desire, while their food was in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them, and he killed some of their stoutest ones and subdued the choice men of Israel. Just thought I'd start on a light note this morning. Um, the thing that, uh, 
the thing that stood out to me in, in this is I've always thought about manna as this amazing provision of God, this amazing miracle. And it is. There's a lot of scripture that tells us how amazing it is. But the thing that stood out to me here and what actually I saw in this passage is manna wasn't, as far as I can tell, it wasn't actually God's perfect will for the people of Israel. It was actually uh, their desire. Verse 29 it says, he gave them food according to their desire, not his desire. And it just, it, it, it's their, actually their unbelief that prompted manna to be made and it was actually made by God in his wrath. Verse 21, he was full of wrath and yet fire kindled against Jacob. And um, it made me think, it just made me wonder, what would God have done if the people hadn't grumbled and hadn't asked for food? Um, and I, I don't think that we'll ever know, obviously, but um, we know that, for example, their sandals didn't wear out for 40 years. In Deuteronomy, twice it says that. Their sandals didn't wear out. They traveled around for 40 years and their sandals never wore out. So we know that God worked miracles for them. So maybe they wouldn't be, maybe they wouldn't even be hungry for 40 years. I don't know. Um, but regardless, um, at this asking for food according to their desire is a great picture to me in Philippians 3 where he says, whose God is their appetite and it ends in destruction as, as it says in Psalms that they, while they still had food in their mouths, some of their stoutest ones died. And um, I, that's kind of where my head was at. I was thinking about, wow, what would God have done? Um, but for me, I was kind of convicted as I was thinking about this that um, what's more important, or what is more important, knowing exactly what it means for um, my God to be my appetite, or is it more important um, to know where I stand uh, in my own spirit, to know the exact meaning of these things or to, or to, to allow this a scripture that's kind of confusing like verse 19 to actually pro prompt me to self-examination. And um, I was thinking about uh, sandals, thinking about their sandals not wearing out. And Deuteronomy 29 um, is where Moses is talking to the people and he's saying, he says in Deuteronomy 29 verse 5, just turn there. He says, I've led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandal has not worn out on your foot. Um, and I, I, was, I was looking at that thinking about what miracles God had worked, but then he, uh, God, I feel, really led me to the previous verses. So I want to look at verse 2 through 4. It says, Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before you rise in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land. Verse 3, The great trials which your eye has seen, those great signs and wonders. Verse 4, Yet to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. And this made me think that it's the most important thing, more important than understanding exactly what these verses, which are kind of um, confusing, mean, as I'm, as I'm tempted to do. The most important thing is for us to ask God to reveal the true state of our heart to us. Um, this verse, verse 4, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. It just reminded me, it's easy for me to get caught up with things like, what does their glories and their shame mean? Or what does their God is their appetite mean? But the more important question is, if you look at Philippians 3, you know, verse 18, he talks about, many walk of whom I have often told you, and now tell you weeping, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. The most important question is, am I unknowingly, am I an enemy of the cross of Christ in some way that I don't know of? Um, and the answer is, I don't know that, but I can ask God to show me. I can ask God to reveal the, um, the things which are displeasing to him. In fact, I would say I am, I must be an enemy of the cross of Christ in some way. And way more important than trying to understand the exact meaning of these phrases, which can send me kind of on endless journeys, is saying, God, please give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear, that I would know how I'm displeasing to you because, um, because that's the most important thing. I, I want this to stir in me a godly self-examination. Um, there's a psalm, I, I don't, uh, someone mentioned it to me at CFC at the conference and I wish I uh, knew the reference. If anybody knows it, feel free to shout it out. But it says um, something to the effect of uh, who can know his own heart? Does anyone know that psalm? It's, it's, Something, it's, yeah, oh, 19 verse 12. I think, I think you just, 
uh, reminded me. Psalm 19, let's see. Yes, 1912. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. And what that brother, he just, he pointed that verse out to me in a completely different context. But it just, this Philippians 3 passage, as I was thinking about what does all that mean? It just reminded me, more important than trying to figure out what all those phrases mean is saying, taking each one and saying, God, do I, is my end destruction in some way? Is there anything I'm doing that the end is destruction? Is there any way in which my appetite is ruling me? Is there any way in which I'm glorying in something that's shameful? Is there, are, there thing, is there, are there areas in my life where my mind is set on earthly things? And using these things as prompts to ask God to give me eyes to see and give me ears to hear. I don't, even, I don't need to have perfect understanding of what those phrases mean, but if they're just little kind of hooks almost that I can use in my prayer to ask God to give me eyes to see, that's enough. And, um, and so that's, that's really what God laid on my heart as I was studying this uh, verse this week. So <clears throat> we'll, have, um, we'll have some time to sing praises to God, and then we'll have a uh, time of prophecy and a time of teaching. So in a mo- after, after we finish singing, um, we'll get a show of hands to see who has something they'd like to share. And then we'll go from there. So uh, musicians, go ahead and come up. I'll get the mothers in the back.